I was cleaning out my desk this morning, wasn't planning on making a video today, but I came across a poem. My mom used to write poems there for several years, and they're real simple, and but full of wisdom. And with a foreword, she'd have like a short foreword story with her thoughts, and then she'd have her poem. And I, uh, I saw this and it led me to some, some Bible verses and some thoughts. And I thought that I would just share this with you guys today in case anyone needs to hear this. And there was something I noticed. I noticed I read this before, but I hadn't thought of it as, in exactly the same way. Um, and the poem is called, it's about righteousness, and it's, it's called I Love Your Face, talking about Jesus. And my dad used to always say that was kind of his thing he just radiated the love of Christ and when he would see me and when he would see other people he'd say I love your face you know <laughs> he'd give you a big old hug I mean that was just kind of his catchphrase but I was thinking about how I love your face beholding is relates to beholding the face of Christ as believers especially in this context and I just wanted to read this to you I'll start with her little foreword Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The sermon today stirred a lot of thoughts in my mind. She, my mom wrote this back in 2008. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. When our hunger and thirst is for him, then and only then will we be satisfied. It's so measurable to have debt hanging over your head. You know, debt weighs on you. To know you owe something weighs on you, especially if you don't know how you're going to pay it. It's a, it's a burden on your shoulders. And part of that satisfaction, part of the satisfaction of being in Christ is knowing that your debt is paid. It's paid off. Sometimes I think that if I prayed more, if I read the Bible more, if I did more for other people, then I would be more acceptable to God. At those times, I'm seeking satisfaction and assurance from my deeds. How utterly foolish. It's like mailing in a dollar payment on a trillion dollar debt. My good deeds do not make me more saved more loved or more acceptable they will never bring satisfaction I will just struggle to do more and more of them if they are the result of anything other than my love for God they are useless even though we know that Jesus died and fully paid for our sins I think we are all guilty of wanting to offer God a payment of our own on a debt that does not exist. If a generous benefactor paid off our home mortgage, would we feel obligated to continue sending in our house payments? I think not. Lord, I don't want to be such an ingrate that I won't fully receive your wonderful gift. May I reckon as dead this flesh that strives for acceptance and run with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength with the one, the one that satisfies. Thank you for your gift. It's so wonderful to be free from debt. Yippee. <laughs> it really is. I mean, does that not produce just a heart of thanksgiving that's just so in love with the Lord for what he has done. We love him because he first loved us. And her, this, this is a little poem that goes with that. I love your face. I wonder why I don't always feel saved, though you, Lord, paid such a price for me. Could it be that it's myself I'm trusting and not what you did on that tree? My heart knows I cannot pay for my sin. My page is stamped, debt satisfied. 
Lord, when you cried out, it is finished. Could it be that I think you lied? Is it my pride that causes the struggle? Does my flesh want some of the credit? Do I want to make it on my righteousness so I can end up with a debit? You know, like working for a wage, right? Lord, may I receive your expensive gift. Let me rest in the peace of your grace. May works that I do not be for my gain, but just because I love your face. And that reminds me of 2 Corinthians 3.18. What can, when we know we have nothing to give and nothing to contribute, what's left but to, but to just behold Christ in all of his wonder and this wonderful gift that's been given us out of great love and mercy. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. We can face him. We can look at him and behold him because that veil has been removed. Because he paid our debt in full. You know, the Bible talks about the law being like a veil that condemns us and separates us from God. It's our sin. And that sin is made evident and, you know, even more evident by the placement of the law. But it says here, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. This is not our doing. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. When you look this up uh, in the Greek, in the Strong's Concordance. Reasonable service here is like an, an act of worship. It's like the fragrance. This is a sacrifice. You know, a sacrifice can do nothing but lay on the altar. You reckon and understand your death, your body, your flesh is, a, is sin flesh and no good exists in your flesh and you're laying it on that, on that altar to God. Um, not trying to, to offer him filthy rags righteousness from your flesh, but letting him produce the work and the fragrance of, fragrance of Christ in you that is good and acceptable in a reasonable service and act of worship. He looks at us and deals with us on the basis of Christ and accepts us because of Christ's sacrifice, you see. And we're now accepted in the beloved, but this... This verse, I've heard it used by legalists saying, well, God does accept our flesh and good does accept in our flesh because look, we can offer it to him. A sacrifice lays on the altar. And then he, when it says living, he does. We are still alive, but we reckon this flesh dead and let him animate it. It's like, uh, like a hand in a glove. It's his spirit working to move in us. And, uh, we walk according, according to his leading, according to what, okay, so, and then, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You see, there's no, there's no boasting. We're not going to glory or boast in his presence. It is the glory of God, and he, Christ, is the, all those things to us. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. 
and we just love his face. We just look at him in awe with a heart of thanksgiving, just amazed at what he's done for us and love him because he has first loved us. Yeah, I hope this blessed you guys. Have a great day.